muted right there. So welcome back. I'm just gonna repeat everything I just said. Welcome back. We have made it to the, to the last presentation. And as Audrey says, of course, take us home, Marie. Um, she was actually talking about that playlist. She gave me a playlist to kind of choose songs from. It is Afrolatchian. My Afrolatcha. My Afrolatcha on Spotify. It's not. And on, I'll spell it out. It's not on iTunes, but it's on Spotify. So my Afrolatcha. If you go there, I think it's about four hours worth of music. So I just kind of pulled some songs from there. And the last one, as as Aji points out, was the Ebony Hillbillies. Mm -hmm. So Bree is our final presenter. She is actually right now, um, has an exhibit at the museum here at Piedmont College. Mm -hmm. She's a self-proclaimed, and I love the way she phrases this, cultural pollinator. Uh, she uses visual art to ignite sustainable collaboration in the pursuit of social justice. She was born and raised in Tacoa, so right down the road from here. Received a degree from UGA and the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, she has exhibited, exhibited at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library and Museum in Austin, the Center for African American History and Culture in DC, the Smithsonian, and the Studio Museum of Harlem in uh, New York City. She co-curated the pioneering exhibition Common Ground After Latcha at the August Wilson African American Culture Center in Pittsburgh. And she is the founder of the Afro Latchian Artist Project, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Like I said, she has an exhibit right now in the lot, in the museum here at Piedmont. So if you're in the area, make sure you stop by and see it. A uh, brief selection of her awards include the Georgia Council for the Arts, Individual Artist Grant, Mid-Atlantic Art Councils, um, NEA Fast Track Challenge Grant. She's been included in Southern Women, more than 100 stories of innovators, artists, and icons, which is from the editor of Garden and Gun. And she is 2020-2021, Lehman Brady, visiting professor with the Center of Documentary Studies at Duke University and the Department of American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Welcome. I'm going to just have this mask on just for a moment because since we're talking about artists, this was, is um, a COVID face mask made by um, a group of young people in Knoxville, Tennessee called So and Cell and Kishe Alamine, who is a sociology professor. Um, this is one of her many projects that she's working on in the community where she lives. She's also one of the hosts on the podcast, Black in Appalachia that was recently featured in the New York Times. So I'm telling you, you could get a beautiful face mask from the region. Um, so here we are at the end of an incredible day, and I am going to talk specifically about a project, one project that I worked on. You could go back and look at my resume, and um, as it may supposed to materialize, a profile um, on my work um, in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution this Sunday, Sunday edition, uh, written by an incredible writer, Candace Dyer. So I'm going to um, take this time to talk about a specific project. Now, let me see if I can do this real quick. Okay, Matt, I'm clicking on the PowerPoint to bring it up. Okay, there it is. Like magic. Okay. Trying to get rid of stuff I don't want. Oh. I always forget how to, I get crazy on this. Okay. All right, okay, so there we are. I did not breathe while Matt was here, <laughs> so I'm good. All right, so um, this presentation I'm calling A Tale from Afrolatcha, Confederate Monument Meets Black Lives Matter Street Mural. Um, because that's basically what the project is about. Now, 
I'm not going to show you the documentary that I normally do about um, the Afrolatian Artist Project because now that you see the spelling on the slide, you can look it up because I wanted to spend more time talking about the actual art and the context for the piece. But I'm gonna take a little bit of time to the very least put the word into context. I don't know why this is working like that. Okay, should I just hit the arrow? I always forget. All right. Yeah, because we got, why am I getting all this other stuff on here? Okay. All right, let me move this over a little bit too so that you can see the screen a little bit better. Are they getting part of the screen or all the screen? That's what I'm wondering. Okay, great. All right, that's that's good. Can I just show as presentation, but you said that wouldn't work. I'm trying to figure out how I could float. How can I shut this? Ah. All right, that's a little bit better. We'll just work with what we can. What I'm gonna try to do is grab that corner. No, I can't. Okay, anyway. This? Thumbnail, go away. Yay, everybody clap. All right. So, oh, you're very um, responsive. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. All right, so if you read The United States of Appalachia by Jeff Biggers, this is a pull quote from his book. This is an important part of my um, realization um, about my connection to this place. Um, earlier today, um, I believe we had um, one of the presenters and I would like to, I like to invoke, Dr. Merritt was saying that, you know, she was a Southerner who had been very much interested in social justice issues and had never heard about Lillian Smith. Um, I grew up right down the road, Stevens County, had never heard of Lillian Smith. In that same vein, I will say that I um, grew up in this region, have always loved this region, but um, never really felt connected to the term Appalachia. Never felt embarrassed about being from this region. But I was one of those many people of color and actually some white people of a particular class or those who were from, you know, a lower economic class that wanted to run away from this term. But when I read Jeff Bigger's book, The United States of Appalachia, this phrase really caught my attention. The Appalachian region is much more than one ethnicity and a series of isolated enclaves. In fact, the region's inhabitants are as diverse as its terrain, which ranges from high mountain peaks to gentle hill hillsides from rural to full on urban, like Pittsburgh, like Birmingham. And that's how I came to look at this region in a different way and fast forward through a lot of information that could probably come up in the Q and A, ended up creating this thing called the Afrolatian Artist Project, which celebrates the, the diversity, especially as it relates to the visual arts. Now, I did not invent the word. And rather than take time to talk about that now, I can tell you a little bit more about the origin story. But the word itself was created by a group of Ken uh, Kentucky poets in 1991. But moving us into this tale of, you know, a Confederate monument and a Black Lives Matter mural, 
let's talk about how this place has anything to do with the Black Lives Matter mural. I didn't put little pins on here. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, but I'm not a graphic designer. That will happen, you know, because I really am going to animate this list and add to it. But this is a very brief list of actual places where Black Lives Matter marches and rallies took place in Appalachia. Not just signs up in people's yards, but actual marches and rallies. I neglected to put Dahlonega on there for the state of Georgia, but you can go on, like you could probably even add some that you may even be aware of. But going all the way down the list for Appalachia, as you see in the map from the Appalachian Regional Commission, there's a wide variety of places. So as an artist, I watched all of the things happen last summer. Um, I was horrified like many of you. I, you know, constantly, you know, kept in dialogue with friends and family and colleagues. Um, I'm, I'm an old girl getting ready to go on to Twitter and Instagram now that I've, you know, heard about how I can expand my horizons beyond my Facebook page. But at the very least, I posted as much as I could, especially about the art that was being created, whether it was storefronts that were being painted, um, exhibition opportunities that were being made available, or the artists were claiming for their own guerrilla pieces. When I say guerrilla, you know, uh, pop-up pieces that were done, you know, overnight by youth and various other people. But when the opportunity uh, present itself for me to um, submit my work or myself for consideration for the Asheville Black Lives Matter street mural. That was like the perfect place. Um, over the last 10 years, since the Afrolatchian Artist Project has been in existence, I've been working um, throughout the region because you heard all the different places, you know, all those different states I've been to and I've had some kind of contact with artists but I specifically focus a lot of my attention in Western North Carolina, Northeast Georgia and East Tennessee. So these are the artists that were chosen for that street mural and it was a competitive process. So each of us were given a word and then we went on to be able to hire, yes, hire, everybody was paid support artists. And the actual idea um, was a collaboration between the city council and uh, the Asheville Arts Council. And the most, I guess, passionate member of the city council was councilwoman Shanika Smith. So I'm going ahead and giving, you know, credit to all the people that were involved in this as we go forward. Before I talk about the actual mural, I am going to take some time to walk you through what started it all. Because this day is really celebrating artists. And I love the fact that someone said that very often the artwork that's created in um, popular culture informs people and then leads them to action not the other way around. And very often it kind of comes up that, you know, well, artists are inspired by the things around them and they're kind of like following, but sometimes we have an immediate way to lead. We don't have to wait for a commission even. In this case, it was, you know, a paid commission, but we don't have to wait for, you know, a documentary film to be made or something like that. We're on the street working already. So I wanna tell you about how a mayor partnered with artists to get this as an idea out there in the world. And then it became this movement that we're very familiar with. So I'm gonna begin by saying that this is the very basic description that 
gives you an overview of what happened, but I wanted to literally be able to read you an account as told by one of the participants um, in the original street mural that was created in Washington, DC. And I'm guessing we don't have this with my video, but that's all right. We'll see what we can do in just a minute. We'll see when we get to that part. That's, that's not a problem. There's plenty of other things to see and talk about. That'll give us more time for a question and answer at the end. All right, so June 5th, 2020, Dr. Um, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. And I'm gonna just give you the overview as I read out loud the account. Kiana Jones received an unexpected call from a fellow artist about a secret project starting in just a few hours. Was Jones available? The mother of two, ki um, the mother of two children under 10, Jones scrambled to find childcare. At eight o'clock, she joined a Zoom call. The lead artist explained that Muriel Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., had commissioned eight artists to paint a mural of 50 eight foot high, 50, 50 foot high letters spelling out Black Lives Matter, 50 foot high across two blocks of the street leading to the White House. The group plotted how to make the mural in a bold shade of yellow, where to get supplies and the logistics of finishing by midday. Context. Four days earlier, federal and local law enforcement officials had used flash grenades, chemical spray, and smoke to drive hundreds of mostly peaceful protesters out of the area around the White House so that then President Trump could walk to St. John's Church and wave a Bible briefly in front of photographers. The mural was supposed to finish in front of the church and in the, in the streets that span two blocks. In the Zoom call, it got a little uncomfortable, Jones said, who was African-American. The artists agreed that they would participate only if they could remain anonymous, because there was great fear at that time that there may be immediate backlash. Sworn to secrecy, the eight artists met at 3.30 a.m. on Friday. The first beat took us three hours, Jones recalled, and I kept saying, oh my goodness, are we going to make it in time? They ran out of paint. They had only three gallons partway through the L in the word black. They didn't get any more paint until 7 a.m. And it was a different shade of yellow. The deadline was only four hours away. You can hear the rest of the story. And you know that the rest of the story was that it was successful. So this is an aerial view so that you can actually see the work that they did. And the DC Black Lives Matter street mural became a movement, not a moment, and sparked a trend of Black Lives Matter street murals around the world. And if we have some time, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But here's a closer view so that you can see those incredibly bold colors and those huge letters. And then you get a closer view and we'll see. Wonderful photograph of Mayor Muriel Bowser posing with the late Congressman John Lewis soon after the completion. Um, this was his last official public appearance. Um, and I can't help but think that this weekend is the anniversary of the Selma um, crossing, the bridge crossing. So you can see the importance of having him there to be able to see how the next generation was caring for it. That at this particular moment, the civil rights movement. So this is where I'm gonna make a switch and bring you to 
the project that I was able to work on. So this is the location for the Black Lives Matter street mural in Asheville. One of the things I didn't bring in um, images to make the contrast, but as you probably know, if you just, what you, the image you just saw and the images that you may have seen in news accounts is that murals went from that very bold, very utilitarian highway color that they had to probably grab up at a moment's notice because they were using, you know, city funds and, you know, the actual plaza had to be renamed. It's part of what she was wanting to accomplish as mayor to answer back to this, you know, egregious act um, of, you know, taking away protesters, peaceful protesters' rights. But as it evolved, you had various artists who used those letters as a way for everybody to participate. So you had children and people who might not have ever painted before literally use those letters like a coloring book. Our project was a lot more intentional, um, not to take away because I'm not saying one thing is better than the other. It's just talking about how each mural has its own story, but because we were professional artists, we thought about the imagery that we wanted to use and the Asheville City Council didn't just want a Black Lives Matter mural, street mural in the city. They were actually making a statement about Confederate monuments because the site of the work is around the base of the Vance Memorial. So it, um, it's compelling because it embellishes the roadway that encircles the infamous Vance Monument. And the actual phrase ends directly in front of the recently expanded Asheville Art Museum. So you can see some quick views, but I'm gonna give you some close-up views so you get a better idea. So this is the plaque that's there. All right, so here's the story. Asheville businessman George W. Pack, because uh, it's now called Pack Square. How many people have been to Asheville? All right, we got a few. Well, George Pack offered property for a new courthouse on the condition that the former site become part of the public square and donated two thirds of the cost for a monument to Buncombe County native and Civil War Governor Zebulon Baird Vance. Local architect Richard Sharp Smith designed the Vance Monument, erected in 1896. The courthouse no longer standing was completed in 1903. And in an expression of civic gratitude, municipal authorities renamed the newly enlarged square in Pack's honor. Zebulon Baird Vance was governor of North Carolina during the American Civil War and a U.S. Senator from 1880 until his death in 1894. He had also lived, was not born, but had lived in Asheville. So this was a very overt um, act of honoring someone who had been sympathetic to the Confederacy. And uh, on some accounts may have been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Construction of the 60-foot obelisk honoring Vance began December 22nd, 1897 with a band playing Dixie as the cornerstone was laid. The location of the obelisk is present day Pack Square on land owned by the city of Asheville and the inscription on the plaque reads as you see, um, Confederate soldier, war governor, et cetera, et cetera. And it is placed by uh, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, am I saying that correctly? Okay, I just, 1938, okay. And Pack Square has evolved and expanded over the years, yet still remains the symbolic center of Asheville. It's located at the intersection of Patton, Biltmore and Broadway Avenues in the historic district. So this next slide gives you some sense of the scale and it can be see seen from miles around. 
65 feet granite. The other thing, if anybody would like to entertain this discussion afterwards, because we've talked about appropriation, is that this monument to a governor who is aligned with the Confederacy is an ancient architectural form from Egypt. It lets us know how incredibly complicated our uh, public spaces are, that it would be not just appropriated, but co-opted in this particular manner. So here we go on our journey. So I wanted to begin by giving homage to the artists that are um, part of my part of the team that were the lead artists. And um, I don't have time to read their bios, but in previous um, presentations, I haven't been able to let you see their faces. So now I am. Um, this is Joseph Pearson, who was the artist who rendered the design, was the lead artist for the word black, who is, I think, born and raised in, um, I think he's in a New Orleans um, native, but I pretty much, yep, I knew you'd love that, Matt, um, and, but he has been in Asheville for quite some time and is settled into the arts community has an extensive exhibition uh, career, um, academically trained uh, visual artist. I think he also went to the uh, New York School, um, one of those um, wonderful ateliers. Um, it has all those formal uh, skills of drawing and painting and whatnot. Next is Jenny Pickens. She is an Asheville native. And what was so wonderful about the selection of these artists is that even though all three of us are African-American, that our experiences are so diverse, she is a self-taught artist. And this was one of the major projects that she did as part of her career. Um, so it was really wonderful to see, you know, how, you know, each of us approached this project in a different way and, and brought our full set of skills to, to the experience. And one of the things that um, she said early on is that if she had had more time in the process of coming up with the design and rendering this particular piece, she would have put in some family members because she remembers, I think it was a great uncle and aunt that played music downtown at one point in her memory um, as part of her family history. And then you know this person. Um, I thought I might have on a mask, so that's why I put my picture in. But um, And then me, of course, Marie Cochran. But since each of us were um, coming from so many different, um, you know, uh, arts experiences and had different styles, um, one of the things that we thought about, and we never worked together before, is we thought about how can we find some kind of unifying factor in this project and not sacrifice or have to compromise on our work. And we immediately came up with this, actually there were two different things. I'm talking about the palette, red, black, and green, which I'll refer to. Um, but one of the things is we really wanted to have African, continental African iconography that we weren't going to approach it from the standpoint of having people just fill in these, you know, beautiful colors and have it be, you know, that type of Black Lives Matter um, street mural. We also did not, we chose not to focus primarily on the issue of police brutality. There was one clear image that we all agreed had to be in it. We'll talk about it in just a minute but we wanted to make this almost like a sacred space, especially because it was around the base of this Confederate monument. 
So you see on the right um, an image of um, kente cloth from the Ashante people of Ghana. And then on the right, you have the red, black, and green unifying uh, palette that we came up with. There are a couple of other colors in there, but predominantly it's red, black, and green. But let me give you some background about these colors because it was really amazing when I went back and did my research uh, about the wonderful synergy that took place in coming up with this idea. So, as I said before, we unanimously decided to feature the colors of the Black nationalist flag as a unifying design element. Unbeknownst to us, that year marked the 100th anniversary of its creation. The Universal Negro Improvement Association is a Black nationalist fraternal organization founded by Marcus Garvey. And um, I will not be using the N-word, but I'm going to read to you the reason why this flag even came to be. The flag was created in 1920 by members of the UNIA in response to the Coon song that became a hit around 1900 called Every Race Has a Flag But the Coon. This song has been cited as one of the three songs that firmly established the term coon in the American vocabulary. In a report of a 1921 speech appearing in the Negro World Weekly newspaper, Garvey was quoted as saying, and I quote, show me the race or the nation without a flag, and I will show you a race of people without any pride, I, in song and mimicry, they have said, every race has a flag but the coon. How true, I, they can't say it now. The UNI created a flag, a pledge, and a publication that provides the meaning of the colors. Red is the color of the blood, which men and women must shed for their redemption and liberty. Black is the color of the noble and distinguished race, to which we belong. Green is the color of the luxuriant vegetation of our motherland. And as it's been said, there's some uh, variations, but not as a UNIA flag. Um, very often you will sometimes see that yellow as uh, also a symbolic reference to gold. Um, and that's why I also chose this particular kente pattern to um, give you some sense of the uh, imagery to give attribution um, as African-American artists to African and Pan-African culture. So here are the sketches because I, as an artist, always loved it when my art history teachers showed me the sketches. Joseph Pearson's sketch for the word black. Now, when you have the opportunity to see um, the overview, and unfortunately we don't have the individual um, slides so that you can see each letter, but I will give provide the link to the Asheville Arts Council website for this project, which will be on display, I mean, available to the public indefinitely. Um, you will see in a small scale, a portrait of Mr. George Floyd over to the left, when in fact, in the completed work, it dominates the letter B in an incredibly beautiful way. And then the second letter, you have an image of Ron Carlos, John Carlos, one of the um, two protesters during the 1968 um, Olympic games when they raised the black power fist. Um, it's one of those early athletic protests that precedes um, um, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Same time, you know, that there are these growing um, public displays by black athletes. So you see that in the letter um, L. Then you have co-joined hands that he has in the letter A. 
um, really signifying this um, sense of solidarity as he explains it between people of color across the spectrum. Uh, if you want to reduce it down, but we'll just for the sake of having a list, but Latinx, um, all people of African descent um, in that image in the A. And then he also included another uh, Adinkra symbol, which you'll see these sort of throughout the, the piece. Then he also, in the letter C, um, put in the phrase, silence is violence. And he plays off of um, a speech by, made by Martin Luther King. And in the very last letter you see in K, he's pulling in images of protesters and also of early uh, imagery that could, oh, there you go. You're amazing. <laughs> there we go. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, we can go back real quick. Um, and there we, there it is at the bottom. Uh, you also, I'm, one, I'm so glad that you have attribution that we can give to the um, artists that are the support artists, which I'll go back to. Wonderful example, um, let me go back to C, is that um, the artist that did the letter C is a Latinx um, artist. But the letter K, as we said, uh, is once again this protester, but then you have this interesting melding of almost like a, an abolitionist image of enslavement on the wrist of a Black Panther fist. Then next up, I have to go for a minute. Let me just do this. If I can go back, Matt, can I bring that down for a minute? Can I go back and forth? Okay, all right. Well, you won't see the sketch, but that's okay. Let's see the finished work. Um, you have the letter, well, the, the next word, which is um, lives. And this is where artist Jenny Pickens picks up. So you put a little space between the word black here we go with lives, and you can see the difference in style. So Jenny Pickens um, chose the following artists that you see listed underneath, because what we did is we did those sketches that you saw in the previous slide, and then we actually hired artists that rendered the images. To the extent that our knees and our backs could allow, we put you know our own you know uh, sweat into the actual rendering of the work but the design was ours. The design was ours. And even in that mode, we gave artists, because we all hired artists, the, um, the freedom to be able to take that uh, imagery in dialogue with us, just like we would work on anything. Uh, if we were working with students or other artists um, who were not the lead, and they were able to do some variation on our design. So what you see in the letter L is an, a play on the word, I can't breathe, which was the last dying words of Eric Gardner. But also in that letter L are images that also suggest COVID mask. Then Walter Dickerson, who was pretty much graffiti artist, spray artist, did this interesting, almost cartoon image that's both in some, I don't even, sarcastic way, a, a, a mixture of, of comic book style, but also protest style about hands up, don't shoot. The letter V um, is talking about the spirit realm and we have this image of a um, figure that almost suggests Lady Liberty also masked on one knee, Colin Kaepernick style. And then just for variation and abstract possibilities, whether you think about African-American artists like Alma Thomas and others who don't rely on figurative work, um, Beth Ivey, uh, completed the E because lives was supposed to have a different feel, a different flair. So all of these things of joy and sorrow all mixed together. And then last but not least at all is the letter S that um, Timothy Davison worked on with his mother. So the lead artist is Jenny Pickens. 
and she uh, worked with her son on this letter. And if you click on, yeah, let's just see. If you click on the letter S real quick, what's really beautiful about this website is you get a chance to see the artist that were the support artists. And that's um, Jenny's son. So matter is my word. And that is Lakeisha Blunt. We'll just go ahead and scroll up so they can see the whole thing. And then we'll go and click on those letters. This was brilliant, Matt. Um, let me talk about the imagery and then you can hit the letter so that we can see the artist. Matter actually scrolled around the base of the um, monument. Stop, stop, stop. Don't go crazy on me. Oh, there. Thank you. See, you're kind of reading my mind. Um, and as you can see, its placement is right in, from, in front of the Asheville Art Museum. So you can see the full view. And we don't even have to go back um, to the um, PowerPoint because we can just work off the website. All right. So each of these letters in my particular case, I literally considered the artists that were going to render them. So I wanted to be able to have that overriding aesthetic of African, African American imagery, but also um, their story somehow um, included. As it turns out, all of the artists that I was selecting, you know, we were all were talking about having artists with a connection to Western North Carolina in some way. They were all graduates of Western Carolina University. They all came to campus as student athletes. They all graduated with art degrees. They all became practicing artist slash public school art teachers, defying the stereotypes. So when I chose Lakeisha Blunt and I literally thought about the letter, I didn't randomly pull things out of the hat. She is the person who is most closely uh, tied in my team to the mountains because she was born and raised in Murphy, North Carolina, which is far Western North Carolina. And she grew up in a black community called Texana, which was named after a black teenager. Look it up, that's more for later. But as you can see, we talked about the imagery of mountains. That's why I snuck in that blue, you know, this natural landscape that is very much the Appalachia that we know and love, the Appalachian Trail, et cetera, et cetera. But then you also had this imagery in the top corner where she came up with a stylized um, mixture of kente, but also quilt patterning. So you can touch real quickly so that we can see Lakeisha. All right, next up is Raki Martin and as you were listening to the music um, prior to um, my presentation, that Spotify channel called My Afrolatcha is all black musicians with an exception of one white female vocalist who does a wonderful rendering of Wild Women Don't Get the Blues. But part of what um, I wanted to do is to expand the understanding of black culture, especially since it was right there in Asheville, which is very often thought of simply as a tourist town, but to reclaim as many of us already know, the African origins of the banjo. So that's why the banjo is so prominently displayed in this rendering of the letter A. Um, and you know, in this wonderful stylized pattern that almost looks like um, the head of the banjo is like the head of a tambourine or a drum as a percussive form. And that's Raki Martin at work. She's actually a public school teacher in uh, Siler City, North Carolina. Then you had the two letters T that were co-joined. Co and um, you had, um, let, let me talk before, I, I wanna be able to talk about the imagery and then we'll talk about the artist. 
but two artists worked together. That's why you can see the two. And they were um, close friends in that uh, sort of cohort of art majors that were student athletes. They were both on the track team, uh, Keela Hunt and Trey Miles. So I played on the imagery of the Abeji. So you had the twin figures um, on the vertical uh, part of the, the leather. Underneath, you had cowrie shells. Above, you had these two hands reaching out to touch each other, playing off of the Sistine Chapel image of Adam and God, but as brown hands. And in the middle, which gets doubled in this photograph, there's only one image of a dollar bill. I mean, excuse me, a $20 bill, stylized, is in the central part um, what we are looking forward to from the Treasury Department very soon, I hope, is Harriet Tubman. But what really, one of my favorite things of the, the, the experience was the fact that not only was there a connection between all these artists on my leathers, and the artists were actually meeting each other and connecting in these wonderful ways, but on the left-hand side, you'll see an image, if you touch the letter, of Keela and two of his three children. And they stayed for the entire day. They were part of his support team. And then you have Trey Miles on the right. So there was this incredible communal experience that I can't even explain that took place because there was music playing, there were bicycle racks that went around where we were stationed, uh, where people could come by and watch us paint. Um, and the Confederate monument, the Vance monument for a minute, in my view, disappeared. Um, not only did it in our minds because we were connected to the street and street level activity, but it literally was sheathed by black plastic. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. All right, so we're almost there. E, um, in my original drawing, I had lots of railroad track and was really like, um, had dominated the design with that imagery simply because the, well, first of all, because the letter E itself lends itself to that idea of rails and um, cross ties and all of those things. But the only artist who did not have a direct connection to North Carolina that I brought up was Broderick Flanagan from Athens, Georgia. And there he is. And he was brilliant in the way that, you know, we negotiated and he was able to bring in this youthful imagery of, you know, high top tennis shoes and feet and this movement, this idea of movement and uh, journey that did not stay fixed on my original idea. My original idea was not the Underground Railroad. It actually was slavery by another name. The use of free, free labor, unpaid labor of incarcerated black men after the Civil War, which is very much a part of the history of this region. R, another personal connection to the artist. You can see on, on the far left of the letter, she's playing with that same imagery I said earlier of abstracted forms of railroad and also fabric. But the most important element of this letter is the color red, literally referring to blood in the street in all shapes and forms. Um, and we don't even have to go through the list of names because it's not just blood in the streets. Blood in your own home, Brianna Taylor. So that was important for me to almost amplify the color red, the letter red, and then on a more personal note for the artist, and you can touch the letter for a minute. Faustine McDonald, she is a sickle cell warrior. 
So if you can look again at the letter, you can see the stylized images of red blood cells. All right. So since we are on the page, I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out if I, there's something else I can get that I want to show you. Let's just, let's just leave it with the image of the overview. Oh, no, 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 I know, the group. Let's hit the group. There we go. So that's all the artists together. That was on my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so roughly 20 or so artists. The backstory, in the same way that I read uh, the New Yorker story about the Washington DC um, street mural, we got death threats. Oh, you're back, <laughs> like magic. Um, let me get serious again, because there's joy and there's, what we call it, heartache about this. Um, what you want, might not know is that it was delayed a week because we had a verified threat of uh, a white supremacist group that did not want to see this happen, but it did happen. And with a little bit more time and another presentation, even as an individual artist, I had some pushback. Months later, as a result of this very successful project, because it is true that even as we speak, there are discussions about the removal of that monument by the city of Asheville. But let's end on an uplifting, or I should say, we're not gonna try to do kumbaya. We said we weren't gonna do that. Um, let's, let's end on an inspiring note because this is what today's symposium is all about. And I'm a huge fan of the late um, John Lewis. And I must be feeling good because under normal circumstances, I might get choked up reading this and just seeing his face and knowing that he's gone from us, but still very much present. As we speak, I told you that the city of Asheville is trying to decide what to do with the Vance Monument. As we speak, um, the voting rights legislation that he fought so hard for all his life is being challenged. But in the effort to move forward, this quote is important. He says about the civil rights movement, without the arts, including all of the arts, music, dance, drama, photography. That movement, and I would hasten to say the Black Lives Matter movement would have been like a bird without wings. Um, there's something about the arts that can galvanize people. Um, it gives us another thing to connect to. It reaches us in an emotional, a psychological, a spiritual way that um, a well-crafted essay may not be able to, but not to take away from my talented, and I, and I, I love writing myself, but I call them my friends who are writers with a, cup, a capital W. Um, even then, Martin Luther King's speeches were poetry. Um, Malcolm X's speeches were poetry. Um, Ella Baker, we could go on and on and on. Um, and I'm very proud to have been a part of this project because there is more work to do. 
one of the things I have to say in my closing remarks before I take um, questions, because this is the first time I've really talked about this in a particular way. See, so we had all that passion, all that commitment last summer. This mural, luckily, will stay on the streets of Asheville until next summer. In Oklahoma, where there was a Black Lives Matter mural, it was also painted last summer, it was scraped off the streets last year in October because of protests that said that pro-police groups wanted to have their own mural. So the city decided that they did not want to continue that debate or discussion. And on a Monday morning in October, early hours, the Black Lives Matter mural was scraped off the streets. Now that's a defiant pushback. Um, many of the murals around the country were defaced and people have you know, faced criminal charges and various things have happened from one municipality to the other. Even though the Asheville Street mural, Black Lives Matter Street mural is still there, now it won't be there permanently. It is not a granite sculpture. It is not a bronze sculpture. So the question continues, what is the next step? Art that speaks, but what about the the long-term civic commitment to pieces like this. Questions, anybody? Thank you, Marie. We do have time for a couple of questions. While you're typing those out, I do wanna show you one thing that I was looking up while Marie was talking. Um, there are various spots online. If you just type in list of Black Lives Matter protests, you can actually find maps. But here is actually our area. And here is the one that she mentioned in Clayton, the course right here. Oh, this is actually Clarksville. So this is actually right here next to- um, Oh, you've got to send me this. This is Clayton. Clayton. And we got to get Tacoa on there because I work with the group of young Tacoa. people that yeah, the girl um, was not the, on here. Well, is it? It's right here. No, we got it. There it is. They, oh! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so the Monica is not on I'll here. tell them that. But but you see, if you if you scroll out to Appalachia, the region right there. But then, I haven't scrolled out yet, but I do know you see internationally as well. Right. right. Thank you for mentioning that. Because so I'll, put, I'll put this in the chat. Um, I just typed in, like I said, I just typed in map of black, a BLM protest. And this is the one that popped up. Um, I'm Great. Sure more on here, but I'll put it in the chat for you. So what questions do we have either from the audience or from online? Uh, I have a, well, I'm not going to say it's controversial. I, I have a, I have a, I have mixed feelings. Um, because I've, I've done this and sat and listened to a lot of people. And I'm not talking about people from the other side. Uh, no, there are false equivalents. Um, but what I have come to believe is that there is no one size fits all. That's the problem we always have. You know, each place, those monuments have a story. And I will, for the first time, 
go on record to say that there are Confederate monuments in my hometown. They are so um, you, you can barely read the fact that they're Confederate. They, they uh, acid rain, whatever that else it is, has uh, deteriorated the, the the form of them. And when I came back, well, no, no, I keep saying come back. I've never really left. But when I really started to look closely at them, because I knew they were always there, you know, um, I said to myself, okay, where do I want to put my energy? If they had been blatantly displayed, if there had been a civic organization that wanted to use money to restore them, I would be the first person out to, to protest. Hope you can follow my train of thought here. Because when the Confederate flag came down, uh, let's, let's go all the way back. When it was removed from the Georgia state flag, that was my, my biggest thing. Do not let images fly over public spaces and disrespect black people. So that's, that, that's the first thing. Move them on out, move them on out. <laughs> Done, you know, the, the, the Confederate black battle flag was part of the Georgia state flag, um, not during the 1800s, roughly 1956, after the passage of Brown versus Board of Education as a response to the civil rights movement. And of course, everybody, our time knows, because you probably saw it, um, the Confederate flag being removed from the Capitol grounds at, in South Carolina. And prior to that, a black performance artist, Bree, and I'm blanking on her name, Newsom, scale, a black woman's, went up the flagpole, people forget this, and took it down, was arrested as, a, as, a, as an act of nonviolent protest before Mayor Nikki Haley took it down after the killing, the murders at Emmanuel. So each of these places, as I just said, are so different. So bringing it back to me, my county is Stevens County, which is named after Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy. It's also, Tacoa is the, this was the city center, which is a Cherokee word. Confederate Cherokee. So my, the mascot in my high school are the Indians mm -hmm. with an inaccurate Plains Indians headband. When we know more about the Ch uh, Cherokee culture than we've ever known, we could even be teaching it as a language if we wanted to and really honoring Native American people. So I bring all that up to say that I had conversations with the young people who organized the Black Lives Matter um, rally and I really would like to see there be a, an onslaught of people in my community that wanted to take this on and wanted to be able to work together to, to you know, do more, a lot more to honor the diversity of the community. But right now, I'm more interested in getting a monument to honor our Tuskegee Airmen. Leroy Roberts, that, that's where I would like to put my energy at this particular point in time. But that's a very good question. So we have, we have two questions kind of from, from online and, and one connected with, with the Confederate monuments, but I don't know if you drove down in Clayton, so where Lil is and where the, well, where, you know, Lil lived, um, Lillian Smith lived. But there is a monument there at the courthouse, and I didn't know when it was erected. Somebody says it was erected in 2013, which, of course, is a lot more recent than, than what the one in Tukoa was, 
Because when I drove through Tacoa, the, I think I parked downtown. I was like, let's go to the courthouse. Yep, there it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyways, but in Clayton, a different flag is, you know, um, all around and everything. Or, or they actually rotate it. Sorry. I was like, another question. Another question popped up. But, um, you know, the person that, you know, I wonder what Lillian would do, you know. And I think, answering it personally, I think it's what Marie would do, right? What, what Marie's doing, what others are doing. I would say with, with, the, with this activism, um, with art. But what would you say to that? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm listening to you. I, I, I'm, your voice, I, I couldn't hear, hear everything. So, you said. so like, how would Lil kind of respond to this, do you think? I think that from what I understand, huh, this, that's a great segue. She would have that conversation at the camp. You know, that, that's, that's really what I'm talking about is how we can make these not front, rip from the front pages issues and have them be appropriately placed. I, don't, I can't think of the word, but, but have them be um, organic conversations um, because whether, likely not in public school, but if, if, if there's an opportunity to be in contact with young people in some way um, where there are history programs that people talk about the lost cause, the myth of the lost cause as a start, because even that all to itself was a very intentional, very unfortunately successful way of giving us all this disinformation mm -hmm. about the civil war, about the South, about slavery, about good masters and loyal slaves who didn't want to leave and all of these crazy things. And now what I'm glad to see is, you know, after this, you know, this sort of ocean of, of incredible artwork that that now can be compared um, can be um, brought into the curriculum that's anti-racist. And it's not just until people feel like they've read enough New York Times seller books or whatever, they've seen enough documentaries or they've watched enough talks by, you know, Dr. Henry Louis Gates or whoever it may be, but that it becomes part of the curriculum because that's really the next big push. I mean, the thing that really concerns me as a first-generation college student is that we have these great conversations on college campuses, but K through 12 never gets any of it. It's almost like they're 50 years behind. Um, and it's not because they don't have young, vibrant teachers, I'm assuming who, I don't know what your career plans are, but like yourself, but, but there's no, whew, I say, no support on the school board level or with the superintendent so that when you teach these things that, or when you hope to teach these things that are so provocative that you don't lose your job. That's the discussion that we need to be having. And that would really demand the support of parents um, citizens, people like myself who don't have children, who are just concerned about the truth. Because one of the things that's, you know, in my booklet, this wonderful publication, go see my show at the Mason Scharfenstein Museum of Art on the campus um, through the 25th of tw uh, this, this month, is that we are facing three pandemics. And one of, these are the three, COVID-19, racial injustice, and misinformation. I'm quoting Ken Burns on that one. We, we have time, I, I know we're over, but there were, there were there, we have time for really one more question. Somebody did ask about the Georgia flag um, and that connection, that's something 
maybe I can get you in touch with that person and follow up if you want to. But the sure. last one is from, from Audrey Davenport about, you know, and if, if show Baraka wants to answer it too, sitting right here, you know, what, what, what do you propose for black artists um, specifically as activism, you know, do that will continue the new consciousness that surfaced just after the George Floyd uh, protest? You know, still Fine. call to action you put forth. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not gonna say too much about call of action. I'm just gonna step away from that for a minute because that could be a, another conversation. May, I'll, uh, maybe I'll let, um, let you take that, but, since I just, you know, it's kind of generic, but find a community. Um, that, that's the one thing. Uh, and I'll say this because I know for whoever we're, we have in the audience that, um, you know, some of you may be college students, some of you may not be, but you can find community. I mean, thank God for the internet. Um, and whatever that means to you, because you do not have to go it alone. Well, for one thing, I'll just say this to you, because this is kind of my, one of my pet peeves, is sometimes very talented artists are arrogant, that they feel like, I'm going to do this, and, you know, because you're passionate. But the arrogance comes in the fact that you didn't do your homework to know that there are other artists who've actually laid out a path for you you might not do it exactly like them. Um, but I, I was talking, for instance, to an artist once who worked in collage. They did not know Romer Bearden. Oh my gosh. A black young artist who didn't know Bearden. Now that's not his fault, but We said it earlier, I love the, the fact that you, you said this about uh, attribution. You need to go looking. Um, you could just literally uh, Google black artist and collage and get his name. You wouldn't have to pay anybody tuition. And, and I think that's a great note to end it on that education is a huge part of all of this. Thank you. And community. In person. Thank you for being online. We will make these available. I apologize that Chuck's may not be the best, so we may not be able to make that, but we, they will be available soon online. So thank you. Um, we've enjoyed it and have a good rest of your day.